Okay, so thank you, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I gave a talk to a, uh, not a forerunner of this group, but a Oxford Student Society that had similar titles in its banners um, in 2009. Um, and um, that was my scenarios for the Eurozone economy during the global financial crisis. Um, and I'm coming back to that with this talk because I'm going to employ the scenario method to talk about the future of CBDCs and how they can impact the economy. Um, so I'm not sure what the background of everybody in the room. I'm going to talk about what central bank digital currencies are and why they're important. But also, even if you are not necessarily um, wanting a kind of technical exposition um, of the role they may or may not play, I'm going to try and use some scenario thinking to think about how um, they can create some very interesting potential futures. Um, so I'm going to be applying some of the, the theory, but also some of the scenario methods, which hopefully will be uh, interesting for you. Um, the title is, Are Central Bank Digital Currencies a Good Idea? Just in case anybody kind of has somewhere to be and is going to leave a bit early, I didn't want to just build up till the conclusion. So just to summarise, um, the answer to that is obviously going to be no, as I'm sure you're probably expecting. Um, I, okay. Um, so yeah, if you do need to leave early, like that's the upshot, but I'm going to try and go into a little bit more detail and maybe justify that a little bit because possibly you want a little bit more substance than that simple uh, answer. This is what I'll do in the presentation. Um, so we'll try to kind of define central bank digital currencies. My assumption is that people are familiar with the term, but may be kind of ignorant about what they are. Um, I can't promise to um, fully explain that because part of my talk is going to be that I don't think central banks have a common understanding of what they are um, and there's very different types of central bank digital currency um, so unfortunately I can't kind of give you a clear definition that I understand but I'm going to try and give you um, a way in which I'm thinking about it. I'll try and consider the pros and the cons so I'll give you what I think are the strongest arguments in favour of central bank digital currencies um, and then I'll tell you why they're wrong. Uh, and then also I want to end up with these scenarios. So I want to um, use a particular way of thinking about potential future states um, and then how these central bank digital currencies might affect the economy, society as a whole. So that's the plan and hopefully there'll be some time for some Q&A as well. Um, if you have any questions as we go, please feel free to stop me. I'm happy to answer anything um, as we go through it. Um, Okay, so we start with some definitions. Um, many central banks are obviously talking about this and, and uh, producing some interesting papers. The Fed had a um, consultation, I think, ended uh, last year. I think the Bank of England may still be open, where they're asking a broad um, you know, gathering of different people that have expertise on this to help answer some of these questions. So I think these definitions are subject to change. It's not necessarily the case that anything that I say now will be set in stone. Um, going forwards. Um, just, yeah, I think the, yeah. the UK consultation is still open. And I was going to ask uh, James if I can provide the link that you can put on the website for people. Oh, yeah. So at the end, I've got a, um, there's some further references. And so there's a page on my website where I've got the, those two consultations. I'll put those up. Um, I, I missed the window for the Fed one. I didn't submit a um, response to that. Um, the Bank of England one, um, I have a draft version and I hope to do that. I'll put that on my website if I do um, submit to that. Um, it'll be a bit longer than just saying there are no, but maybe, maybe this presentation is the basis of a, of a, of a sensible response to that. Um, so those two footnotes, I think, are um, you know, quite important ones in terms of the Fed's approach to it and the Bank of England's initial approach to CBDCs. The Fed defines them as a digital liability of a central bank that is widely available to the general public. The Bank of England's definition from their 2020 uh, report, an electronic form of central bank money that could be used by households and businesses to make payments. Uh, the way the Bank of England tried to explain it to people that aren't familiar um, with the banking system is that we have existing digital money such as bank deposits, the money that we make payments for using our debit cards. Um, we have banknotes and coins that are issued by the central bank and can be used in payment. And central bank digital currencies are intended to be this middle ground, um, a digital currency that is issued by the Bank of England as opposed to by the commercial banking system. 
I don't think this fully makes sense, um, so I'll try and kind of explain why I have a kind of an issue uh, with that. Um, if we think of the current payments system, uh, we have notes and token coins, so we're all familiar with cash as a form of payment. Uh, most of us use demand deposits or some kind of debit account that automatically um, withdraws money from our bank account. So uh, increasingly demand deposits are a bigger source of payment using debit cards. Um, underpinning demand deposits are the digital reserves that commercial banks hold at the central bank. Um, so I'm going to be very careful what I say in terms of um, the divisions within the Austrian school about the role of reserves and fractional reserves and things like that. Um, but the commercial banking system uh, has reserve accounts with the central bank. They deal with the central bank directly. Uh, we can make payments with our debit cards, but underpinning that, there are transfers of reserves within the banking system that we as the public um, don't have access to. Um, I think that's probably a simplistic enough overview. Um, when we're looking at these different types of asset, we can think of whether or not they're central bank issued, which notes and token coins and digital reserves are. Um, they're kind of directly controlled by the central bank. They have a monopoly and full control over these things. Um, the commercial banking system plays a role in credit creation when it comes to the money that we have in our bank accounts. Uh, we can also make this distinction between whether or not they're public access and non-public access, um, which notes and coins um, are, but digital reserves are not. So we don't have central bank uh, reserve accounts. I think there's two main ways in which we can view central bank digital currency. So I'm trying to use this kind of pictogram to try and help explain that. Um, the two different versions that we can think of, I think, are a wholesale model of a central bank digital currency. This is what Qualls um, refers to as an indirect model. Um, so he talks about an indirect model of central bank digital currencies, which, as I understand it, is essentially the central bank digital currency operates this space um, being central bank issued uh, but non-public access because it's something that the commercial banking system will actually kind of uh, be the interface with the general public. Um, if that's the model and if that's the case, it doesn't seem to me to be particularly interesting or exciting. Um, and I've called it here a trivial modification of the existing payment system. It's simply a kind of a more technologically sophisticated form of central bank reserve asset, which we the public won't actually have kind of access to we'd still be dealing with our own traditional banks. The alternative is a retail CBDC. So this is a different model. Uh, this has been referred to as an account-based model as opposed to an indirect model. I think the retail wholesale distinction um, makes more sense to me. Um, this is a little bit more um, uh, interesting because a retail central bank digital currency is intended to be directly available to members of the public like us. Um, so we can think of this as something that kind of is issued by the central bank and has access to the public, which is the definition that we saw before. Um, but this opens an interesting question, which is what's the benefit or the advantage of these other forms of digital assets if we all start using central bank digital currencies? Um, we could just think of it as a kind of better version of cash, and I think many central banks are billing it as a digital cash that's like cash but a bit better. Um, I would then suggest, though, what does that leave for digital reserves and demand deposits? Why would we need those types of financial asset if we have a digital asset that the central bank is issuing that everybody's using directly? Um, ultimately, a retail CBDC could imply the end of the private banking system because we'd all be using central bank money and there's no purpose in having private banks and private bank accounts anymore. I don't think central banks are fully um, advocating this because they know that that would be quite kind of dramatic. Um, but it's not obvious to me that they're kind of uh, totally ruling out that being a potential part of the development of central bank digital currencies. Um, the Bank of England plans are kind of referred to as the digital pound. So the consultation that we mentioned before is, um, is the, the URL is there. Sorry, can you explain why if you had a central bank digital currency there would be no need for private banks? I, I don't understand why that would help be the case. So if you can open, if you can access the central bank digital currency directly, then why wouldn't you um, access it directly rather than going through a commercial bank? Why not just have your account with the central bank where you um, make payments using them as the interface rather than using a third party? But wouldn't the bank still offer interest that the central bank would because the bank invests the money, etc., etc., and pays interest on that? Um, 
Well, so we'll look at some different potential models of that. Um, the extent to which um, commercial banks would be able to engage in intermediation, I think, would be dramatically undermined by the by the fact that they would. Well, again, it depends a little bit on how it be implemented and whether or not it, they're able to um, extend credit beyond um, assets that they have, which at the moment they don't do. Um, but we'll see a couple of different models about how that might progress. Um, but I think it would under it would it would it would strip away a large part of what their kind of their their traditional maturity transformation does. Um, some central bank digital currency literature talks about they're merely a, a wallet. So the commercial bank is merely providing a wallet for the customer. So we don't need them to be a, a wallet. It's th like that model, which which I think is is the retail CBDC model, um, is essentially saying that you know Lloyd's Bank becomes a piece of software that allows you to access your central bank digital currency, but they're not allowed to create obviously the central bank digital currency. Um, and at the moment, they're allowed to create Lloyd's Bank money that's derived from central bank reserves. Um, so whether or not you think there's a money multiplier and there's a kind of a close link between what the central bank is issuing and what the commercial banks are issuing on top of that at the moment, um, there is clearly like a disjoint between reserves and the amount of demand deposits we have in the economy. Um, and if the retail, if, the, if, if Lloyd's Banks or whatever is simply offering what the central bank is creating and what the central bank is controlling, then we don't have any ne necessity for them at a, um, a level. They would still be able to do time deposits, they'd still be engaged in some forms of lending and some kind of financial intermediation, but it wouldn't be the, the, the retail bank accounts that we currently, uh, we currently use. Um, okay, so the Bank of England's plans are um, known as digi the digital pound. Again, this I think demonstrates a kind of a, a, a slight incoherency in that at the moment, most of us think of the pound as a digital currency and for m most of our transactions, the pound is a digital currency. Um, this, is an, this is a quote from the Bank of England, electronic version of cash issued by the Bank of England accessed through digital wallets provided by private companies. Um, this table is another kind of way of trying to explain uh, what I had before with, with those models. This is where I'm just trying to think about what the differences are between each of these things. Um, so on the screen there, you've got those two squares, which should be a cross, but there's obviously just a, um, a formatting error um, because I probably used a Mac and it's come up a bit funny. Um, but those ticks, I think, are in the right place and just imagine that those two squares are crosses. Um, what I'm trying to do here is just look at those different uh, elements. So central bank reserves, the kind of the difference between a wholesale and a retail central bank digital currency model, uh, cash as we currently know it, demand deposits, and then I've put cryptocurrency at the end just to see what the difference is there. Um, to summarize this slide, and the main point I'm trying to make here is that it doesn't look like there's a massive difference between wholesale central bank digital currencies and central bank reserves as I've kind of identified those three criteria. You may point out some other rows that might be missing there that do distinguish between the two, but again, my claim is that they're not overly dramatically important, um, and I'd be interested to kind of have a further conversation about what they might be. Um, but that's my point here, that this might be just a trivial modification of the existing payment system. Um, the other model, the retail central bank digital currency model, uh, on paper looks as though it's kind of beneficial compared to cash. And I think this is the kind of the message that's being pushed. It's an improvement on cash. Um, but then also what it's kind of really doing is it's just doing everything that uh, demand deposits and cryptocurrency do, but it's issued by the central bank. So this is the kind of the concern that you might have, which is that what's being sold as an improvement on cash is really a means by which the private banking system, demand deposits and cryptocurrency become irrelevant because the central bank um, has complete control of the banking system. Um, so it could be considered an improvement on cash uh, or it could potentially be considered a means of crowding out the private sector. Um, okay, as I said, I think there's some um, confusion within central banks as to how central bank digital currencies are defined and what their visions are for them. Um, so those are two different ways in which I kind of think about them and hopefully they're useful. Uh, this is just a graphic from Deloitte which is showing the interest in central bank digital currencies around the world. Um, 87 countries, uh, this is a McKinsey report which I recommend, this is a very good overview um, by McKinsey. 90% of global GDP um, are involved in exploring central bank digital currencies, so this is a very big important phenomenon. 
Um, you might notice the countries that ha have made the most progress tend to be um, relatively small economies, also where kind of payments systems are quite different from uh, large established economies. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that might be the case. Um, but the point here is to see that there is widespread uh, large amounts of serious interest in this phenomenon. Um, yeah, so that's a good, so sorry, this is being recorded, so I should repeat your question for the benefit of anybody watching yeah. the video. So the question is, um, it doesn't look as there should, you, we, one would expect there to be uniform interest across the common uh, euro currency area. Um, so my simplistic answer is to take that up with Deloitte because they published it. I suspect you still have central banks within each country. Um, so even though there's a common currency area, central banks are it's still in existence and they're still doing research. Um, so I suspect that there is an element of that, but to be honest, the ECB, I'm just looking on the, um, around the thing, the ECB are looking into this. Um, uh, I think on my website, I've got a link to it. I say Banque de France, wholesale CBDC experimentation. Um, that's a, bit, that's a bit, bit odd because who cares what the Banque de France are doing? We know the ECB are looking at this, so that should probably be, uh, maybe that's a bit out of date actually. It's 2021, maybe the ECB's, um, serious work on this came after the Banque de France. It probably originated with the Banque de France and then has, um, has now become a kind of common ECB-wide uh, thing. Um, okay, so here's my kind of pros and cons um, that I'll, I'll, I'll go through. Um, I don't, um, I've, I've got kind of more detail. I'll, I'll try and go through this fairly um, straightforward without going into too much detail, but if you want me to kind of go into detail on any particular bit, I, I can do. Again, in the footnotes, um, there's a couple of references that I recommend on this topic. Um, so these are what I think are the strong and the weak cases against central bank digital currencies. And you'll see that I'm very clever because I've done twice as many good answers as bad ones, even though I'm going to clearly give you a kind of an analysis that means that they're a bad idea. Um, but this just signals that I'm like pretending to steel man the case. <laughs> I, am, I am genuinely trying to steel man the case. But anyway, uh, central banks have an important role to play in the deployment of digital currency. I think that is a good argument. Like if we have central banks, they have to do various things. And this is a totally appropriate um, thing for central banks to be working on. Um, I think there's some sub arguments here. Um, so one sub argument is that um, people will claim that the payments system is a natural monopoly. Um, and therefore, also maybe that it's a public good. They could be two separate arguments. They could be intertwined. And that being the case, there's a necessity for central bank uh, involvement. Um, my rejoinder to that would be that just because something is a platform does not necessarily make it a natural monopoly. Um, and I think payments technologies are platforms, but they're not natural monopolies. Uh, in the same way that social media are platforms and they have monopolistic tendencies, but economically, I think we can stop short of saying that there's necessarily uh, a single provider being optimal. Uh, another subcategory here um, is that the role of the central bank is to protect the public from cryptocurrencies. So by issuing a central bank digital currency, we're playing almost a regulatory role of saving people and giving people an option so that they're not kind of forced into going into this uh, risky world of crypto. Um, I think this is an odd argument. Um, the demand for Bitcoin um, will not be satisfied by a, digital, uh, a central bank digital currency. Um, the reason why people want cryptocurrencies is because they want to do dark money transfers. Uh, they also want to speculate on monetary debasement because they don't trust central banks to manage the money supply. Uh, a CBDC will not kind of give those people um, what they want. Um, there is an important argument for the regulation of crypto, um, and I think it's a separate one to the advocate, the, um, the arguments in favour of a CBDC, and we should try and keep those separate and prevent central banks conflating them. Um, the other sub-argument here about the central bank role is that if the Fed, Bank of England or ECB don't act and take a lead in this sphere, then they're ceding ground to other central banks who will make more progress uh, and they will get there first. Um, I think that that rejoinder is essentially whether you think it's a good idea. So if you don't think it's a good idea, then it's not sensible to try to be there ahead of your competition. Um, it might be that you want to be first in terms of coming up with a regulatory system 
uh, that has alternative means by which you're achieving your objectives. Um, but if we, if, if we kind of agree that central bank digital currencies are dangerous and bad, then obviously that destroys the argument that others are doing it, we should do it as well. Second main argument um, is that central bank digital currencies can help to improve the payment system. Um, I'm, I'm, sympath I'm very sympathetic to this because I think that the payment system uh, could be improved dramatically. Um, the argument is CBDCs will help uh, transfers of large sums of money. Um, they will also reduce the need for physical cash. So those are the arguments why they would improve the payment system. Um, the rejoinders to those, though, is that the biggest problem with transferring money is international payments, and CBDCs don't see any reason why they would help make international payments uh, quicker and more easily. Uh, the reason for that is that anti-money laundering regulations are why it's difficult to make international payments, and no central bank is going to want to make it easier to be able to evade money laundering. Um, the other thing as well is that we already have fairly effective substitutes for cash. Um, People kind of have options other than cash if they want to use them. The reason why some people want to retain cash is not because of a lack of options, it's because there are advantages of cash um, that digital currencies don't have and a CBDC won't provide the advantages that cash has. Um, <clears throat> third argument, central bank digital currencies make monetary policy more effective at the zero lower bound. So the argument here is that when interest rates are very low, um, monetary policy becomes less effective and a CBDC will make central banks more able um, to engage in monetary policy, doing things like negative deposit rates, um, things like helicopter drops and things. Um, the argument here, I guess, depends on whether or not you think you want monetary policy to be more effective at the zero lower bound and whether you want central banks to have more powers to be able to uh, direct um, the monetary system. Um, ultimately, I think these are really arguments for abolishing cash. So if you want central banks to have more control at the zero lower bound, if you think central bank digital currencies allow them to do that, the only real reason they're allowed to do that is because cash would become less important. So I think a lot of these are arguments for abolishing cash. That's a separate debate. Um, we can have that debate and I don't think we should abolish cash, um, but I don't think we should adopt central bank digital currencies so that we can then abolish cash and get the benefits, perceived benefits of doing so. Um, also, I am kind of um, open to um, central banks doing more open market operations, especially in times of crisis. Um, so this is a point of difference amongst many Austrian school economists. Um, I think an argument is therefore that there might be um, a, a case for widening the scope of open market operations. Um, and you don't need a central bank digital currency to do that. You can do that by just giving more people access to uh, central bank uh, reserve accounts. Um, this is less relevant in the, in the UK because it's in the UK and it, more so in the Eurozone, um, there is quite wide access to reserve accounts. I think in America, it's much more restricted. So I think there's a strong argument to say that the Fed should be more open. Um, in terms of who they're dealing with, um, and that will mitigate some of the, the, um, the perceived need for CBDCs. But I think the Bank of England and, and, and ECB are a bit ahead of that anyway. Uh, fourth, CBDCs can be used for targeted fiscal policy. Again, this, you know, whether this is a pro or a con depends on whether or not you want um, more capabilities engaged in fiscal policy. Um, you know, you can do things like conditional stimulus checks, so you can kind of get money into people's hands that will expire. Um, that could be a quite a powerful fiscal tool. Um, most economists, though, I think are very wary about central banks being engaged in fiscal policy. That's not their job. Does, does the Bank of England paper mention that last point? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure whether the digital pound... One thing I noticed, the, the first paper was a little bit more... The, the 2020 paper was a bit more kind of, this is an interesting idea, let's kind of... What do you think about all this... Um, I think the, the digital pound consultation is, is um, less um, kind of willing to, for the Bank of England to speculate on what it might be like and they're kind of encouraging other people to do that so they don't have to perhaps, um, but I'm not sure, I, I, I can't remember what, um, how much they get into this. Um, it, it does seem to me that um, we do, you know, one big trend at the moment is in a kind of a, a much closer link between fiscal and, and monetary policy. It's very difficult for central banks to publicly push back on that and, and we don't see them doing so. 
Um, so I think this is an argument that is um, not necessarily like it, it, it would be surprising for central banks to make this argument. Um, but these are arguments that I'm trying to kind of um, provide from a wide spectrum rather than just what central banks are saying. Um, <clears throat> Um, so yeah, uh, so um, if you want, um, if you want policymakers to be able to get cash in the hands of people very quickly, and also direct the conditions and the circumstances under which that gets spent, that's an argument in favour of central bank digital currencies. Um, and I'll go into a bit more detail about um, you know the, the downsides of that. Um, but again, I, I would just my only rejoinder to that is a very simple one, um, which is that monetary policy and fiscal policy are two separate instruments um, and the fact that a monetary um, uh, and monetary authority can better conduct fiscal policy um, is is a kind of a, a counterpoint to that a um, couple of other things um, they can reduce corruption and tax evasion these are arguments in favor of cbdc's um, again though only by eliminating a lot of financial privacy um, so this is an old age-old kind of debate about whether or not we favor privacy even if privacy gives people scope to do things that we might not want them to do. Um, again, a lot of the kind of reduction in corruption, tax evasion arguments are really arguments about abolishing cash, not about CBDCs. Um, I have seen some people make the claim that CBDCs will enable smart contracts. So people that like smart contracts um, think that CBDCs can kind of make the, you know, push other kind of innovations and other um, technological developments. Um, but my rejoinder to that would simply be that, you know, we can get those innovations and if they're good innovations, we don't need a CBDC Trojan horse um, to, pr to provide them. Um, the two arguments against, I'll add another one because I thought of another one on the way here. Um, reduces innovation in the industry. I think this is very important. Um, just because we're seeing innovations taking place doesn't mean we need a central bank version. Um, that seems like obvious and in most industries if we see private sector innovation occurring there's no clamor for the government to create create its own version um, we see kind of in social media for example um, changes and disruption and very few members of the public want the government to come up with a social media platform um, uh, I, I would argue that the same things apply for for the world of money um, Essentially, planned version is likely to dissuade private sector activity and reduce future innovation. Fed Governor Randall Quartles has said it occupies the field. Um, so you do see people within central banks saying there's just no reason why we should be um, doing the job of the private sector. Um, secondly, I think is a very important one. CBDCs could undermine financial stability. Um, so at the moment, if there is some kind of a concern about the solvency or the liquidity position of a private bank, um, people will kind of turn up and try and get cash out and they can you know, withdraw their money in cash. Um, yeah, if we have a central bank digital currency, all of that run will be going into the central bank digital currency and you will simultaneously have the kind of the private bank um, suffering from a liquidity crisis and needing central bank help to deal with it. So the central bank is kind of providing the safe harbor that exasperates and makes the bank run uh, even bigger. Um, this increases the need for central bank support for those banks suffering a run. Um, and some have argued that if you have a particularly kind of well-respected central bank digital currency, then this can also have factors um, affecting it from abroad and you can have people in other countries um, all kind of, you know, um, trying to redeem, um, trying to convert their assets, um, selling off anything um, and, uh, and um, uh, financial stability will be negatively impacted as a consequence. Um, third point I'll, I'll add as well is the uh, Misesian argument of the dynamics of intervention. So I think this is a good argument against um, any government policy, but CBDCs, I think it's even clearer where the kind of problems might be. Um, once you adopt a central bank digital currency, this opens up the, the door for lots of other types of policy 
that it enables. Um, and that dynamic of intervention is very relevant. It's not so much about what the kind of negative consequences of the CBDC are, it's where that technology and those powers would lead to, even if that's kind of unanticipated um, at the moment. Um, so just to summarize this point, the main driving force, I think, of central bank digital currencies is a fear of missing out. Um, so when, um, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg announced Facebook's Libra currency, um, that was when the Fed woke up. And I think it's fairly clear from oral evidence um, that the Fed were kind of not paying too close attention. And then the, the worry that Mark Zuckerberg would be the person that would kind of like really break through into the retail market was why they felt they had to do something. Um, now that we're seeing other central banks, you know, make much more progress on this, I think you're seeing central banks all kind of competing with each other because they don't want to be the one that says that we don't have our own plans. Um, and also, I think I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times, most of the supposed benefits um, of CBDCs, I think, are really about abolishing cash. So we can't, um, we need to be aware that that kind of debate is underpinning it. Um, should central banks abolish cash to better conduct monetary policy? Um, I think that's kind of the, where ultimately um, a CBDC uh, could lead. Um, do central bank digital currencies achieve faster international payments? I don't think so. I've not seen any models that would convince me that they do. Um, if you remember when um, people wanted to help Ukrainians, they began renting, you know, buying Airbnb um, just as a means by which they could get money into the hands of people in Ukraine. Um, that demonstrates the kind of the problems of our international payment system. Uh, if you have friends in Sudan now that want to leave and need a few hundred dollars to be able to pay somebody to get across the border into Egypt. Um, as I've been finding out this week, it's really difficult to get that money in their hands if they don't have a crypto account. Um, will a CBDC enable that? I don't think it will. Um, do CBDCs promote broader financial access? No, because as we know, cash is the kind of the most inclusive financial asset there is. Um, and CBDCs rely on some kind of a bank account, which involves some kind of know your lender legislation. Um, and I also mentioned a bit about some of the concerns about it increasing rather than reducing systemic risk. Every time you kind of centralize something, um, you are creating a kind of a concentration uh, of potential risk. Um, okay, we started a little bit late, so if I can go a little bit over, if that's all right, because um, this is where I wanted to kind of end up. This is speculative, um, but I wanted to share it with you because this is how I'm thinking about some of these issues. Um, when we construct scenarios, what we do is we think of some um, underlying trends that we think are shaping the industry that we're interested in. And then we try to think of what are the critical uncertainties that we're not sure which direction things will go in. When it comes to central bank digital currencies, it's clear that digital payments are replacing cash. Um, it's also clear that there is increased competition from the private sector. So I think collectively that means that central banks are not going to ignore this. Um, they are, there's clearly movements towards, um, towards central bank involvement in this space. Um, some of the uncertainties that I think are very interesting are um, will central banks use their regulatory powers to facilitate the emergence of new financial products or will they attempt to direct and control innovation? Um, so what is the role of the central bank? Is it to facilitate or is it to control? Um, and then this issue about the retail versus the wholesale, I think is also something that um, regardless of what central banks are saying their current intentions are, it's not necessarily the case that that will be the CBDC that we might potentially end up with. Now, using those kind of underlying trends and critical uncertainties, you can create a set of scenarios where you have this dichotomy about central banks wanting to have a innovative ecosystem that they're regulating, but they're allowing the private sector to dominate. Um, that's the facilitation versus they're really trying to protect the public from um, private innovation and they are coming up with the new forms of currency. On this other axis, I've got the retail versus the wholesale uh, model about the point at which the central bank is intervening. Uh, the scenarios that I found most interesting within these different quadrants are the following. Um, if we have a retail CBDC where the central bank is intending to control the banking system, I've called that techno-fascism and I've generated a uh, AI image to demonstrate um, what that would look like. I'll explain a little bit more. Um, 
I'll just do, I'll show you the three scenarios and then I'll just briefly describe each one and then I'll be done. Um, this next one is that you've got the, um, uh, again, you've got a uh, kind of more of a wholesale approach. So the central bank isn't actually directly engaging with, the pri with, with uh, customers like ourselves, um, but they are kind of behind that system. Um, so we've got this kind of tip of the iceberg thing uh, and underpinning it, you've got the hidden tentacles of the state uh, still controlling things, even though it doesn't look as though they are. Um, and then the third one that I've got here is where they're facilitating the emergence of digital technologies um, and not dealing directly with the public, and I've called that cryptopia. Um, what I've kind of tried to do with these is, is, is take some shortcuts. So um, is this is a libertarian audience, um, you can probably fill in a lot of the um, kind of what the world would look like in these scenarios. That's the idea of scenarios is that you've got a kind of a fairly, you know, with, a, with an image and a title, you can join the dots pretty much yourself. Um, my claim is Cryptopia is kind of like what libertarians would like the banking system to look like. So I just draw upon a lot of the original literature on what Bitcoin might ultimately achieve. Um, and I'm using the work of Kevin Dowd for the techno fascism. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Kevin's work, um, but he had a wonderful presentation um, that he gave last year where he warned about the dangers of crypto, uh, uh, so the, the dangers of CBDCs. Um, and so that kind of whole vision about what potentially might happen uh, is the scenario that I'm tying into here. Um, okay, so briefly, each of these, techno-fascism. This is a world where technocrats wield immense power over the lives of ordinary citizens, even more so than currently. Uh, cash is retired, private cryptocurrencies are banned, we have a purely digital monetary economy that is controlled by the state. Possibilities in this world, negative interest rates to boost spending, um, targeted helicopter drops to certain groups, so whichever customers, whichever consumers are most likely to spend stimulus money, have their uh, central bank account automatically credited whenever the government needs a boost to spending. Um, whether or not those groups are actually the groups that um, have the biggest proclivity to spend our way out of a recession, or whether or not they're the groups that are kind of, you know, voting for the government of the day is a, is a question to be seen. Um, but we do have complete control over individual spending. Um, this could be tied to things like geography. So for example, if there's some, you might think of some potential kind of dystopian government policy that means that our physical location is restricted somehow. I know it's hard for you to imagine that. Um, but this could be using a central bank digital currency where simply if you're too far away from your home, your debit card just doesn't work. Uh, penalties for spending on certain types of good or service. So we have a very inefficient tax system whereby if you want to buy cigarettes and they get taxed and we have all sorts of inefficiencies within that. Um, but this is a kind of a much simpler way of just ensuring that certain products um, have different prices, not only for um, different tax rates, but for different people. So, for example, you can have a kind of a graded taxation whereby young people have much, much higher uh, tax rates on cigarettes and, young, and older people uh, are given the benefit of the doubt. And as you get older, those tax rates change. Uh, penalties to antisocial behaviour as well. So you may be familiar with some countries that have these types of social um, you know, penalty systems. Um, people that think that um, the monetary economy is too... Um, broad. Um, it's interesting how the central bank digital currency actually is an opportunity to make the monetary system go into our social uh, interactions as well. Hidden tentacles look something like this. Private banks are permitted to issue their own financial products, but they are closely linked to a reserve CBDC. Um, this comes back to the point that you made at the beginning, exactly how that mechanism works determines the kind of whether or not there is anything meaningful about these as commercial institutions or whether or not they are simply one arm of the state, like just a mere kind of conduit. Maybe the government uh, subsidizes them just so that the public don't freak out and have to use the, the central bank. Um, but they're not actually doing it. You know, it's not part of their business model. It's not commercially viable for them to be able to, um, to issue any currency like they currently do. Um, so there's a legitimate debate as to whether the commercial banking system is a competitive one or simply um, a cartel or even actually just, well, yeah, a cartel. Um, regulation reduces innovation and centralizes risk. So this is a kind of a model similar to many explanations for the global financial crisis, where we have a centralization of kind of business models underpinned by the kind of the, uh, the strong um, uh, role of the Federal Reserve sitting behind it in certain um, government-sponsored enterprises. Um, concentrations of activity, 
um, ingredients for another global financial crisis or uh, uh, major um, systemic event. Um, there could be millions of implications here, but I'm just kind of giving you a, a, a few that come to mind. Um, and then finally, Cryptopia. Um, this is where new fintech companies emerge and provide a competitive banking system based on privacy and simplicity. Um, what, what I'm really getting at here is um, those of you that are interested in alternative currency regimes um, will be familiar that sometimes fiat money can be a very uh, libertarian basis for a monetary system. If you have a lapsed fiat currency whereby the government is no longer able to produce more, um, as long as there's kind of certainty as to what of which kind of monetary amounts were printed before the end of a hyperinflation, um, then that can actually serve as, as, a, as a fixed basis. Um, so depending on what the role of the CBDC is in this, we could imagine a kind of a frozen monetary base. We could imagine that the CBDC that gets launched, um, you know, isn't, um, um, there's no open market operations, there's no government policy that's increasing or reducing that depending on um, the economic cycle. We could imagine a CBDC that's launched that is completely frozen and provides the kind of the basis for um, the digital system. Um, many people think now Bitcoin could play the role of being the kind of the digital gold of a financial system that goes back to something where you're outside government control. Um, in this scenario, you have a better alternative to, to, um, to Bitcoin that central banks have, have uh, created. Uh, implications would be some concerns about money laundering and tax evasion that many people would have, uh, hence pirate. Um, and if this was going to happen, there would be a big scope for um, consumer protection or high risk financial products. It would be a very kind of Wild West type banking system with lots of innovation, lots of competition, um, but also um, some negative consequences of that um, that we might be aware of. Um, so the, the um, central bank, the, the CBDC is not a retail CBDC. Right. So Cryptopia involves the, the retail arm is private companies. And this is from the perspective of the, C, of the, the digital currency being issued by the central bank. So it would, a it's, a whole, the, it's a wholesale model of a CBDC where the, the, the central bank is sitting behind the, the, the system and the actual asset that's finding its way into the customer's hand, the retail end, is being provided by private companies. So it is a retail asset. Um, there, there would be retail digital currencies, but the central bank digital currency is not available at a retail level. Um, um, but uh, but in, the, in this model, in this, in this vision, we would all be using cryptocurrency for payments. All of our retail payments would be in crypto. It's just that we would be using cryptocurrency issued by private companies and underpinning that somewhere would be a central bank digital currency that's operating at, at the kind of the base as a, as a current reserve asset is now. Um, Okay, so just to um, sum up before we go to Q&A, um, in conclusion, so far I think central banks have struggled to explain why CBDCs are needed. I think this is very clear from the literature that they've, um, they've produced. It's exciting and interesting, um, but it's not obvious what, like how they've justified their need. Um, just because an industry is new and exciting doesn't mean that the government should take a lead. So there might be an important role, regulatory role here. Um, but it doesn't mean that we want governments to be pro providing the products that we end up using. Um, I think this is a phrase that's been used before. So this, this is a really nice summary of the issue. And I don't claim credit for inventing it. Um, but CBDCs are a solution in search of a problem. And that's what these consultations are all about, is that they want us to provide um, the kind of the problem that the CBDs fixed. So, um, you know, we need to be hesitant about that. Um, and um, recognize that they create problems of their own. Um, so in case you want some further resources, um, the slides of this uh, lecture that I've done that you've been looking at on this screen, there's a URL there and you can download the full presentation. 
Um, when I teach on this topic, um, the, I have a web page with additional resources and links to those consultations and a couple of videos and other things that are related. So if you want to learn more about central bank digital currencies, then that link on my website is very relevant. Um, I've written a book on how I think the monetary system should be reformed. Um, it's called Sound Money, um, and in that I make the case for free banking and abolishing central banks entirely. But because some people find that a little bit over the top and hard to achieve in the next few years, I also in that provide my um, uh, discussion of nominal GDP targets and also uh, reforms to open market operations. So the idea is that these are stepping stones. Um, and if we want to end up maybe with free banking, then an NGDB target might be a good way to get there. Before we get an NGDB target, reforms to open market operations can mean that even though we have a central bank doing stuff, they can do less harm than they currently do. Um, finally, you mentioned my most recent book is called Economics, A Complete Guide for Business. That's intended to be relatively easy to read. Um, it's for MBA students, so it's not technical. Um, but if you want to see any uh, of my thoughts on other parts of economics, um, then check it out. Um, that's everything. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.